Texas City immediately stops adding fluoride to the water. Now, I've seen these types of stories before, but it was always like a one-off. I heard this one, and I knew Derek Bros and a bunch of other people I know have been like doing a whole bunch of fluoride work recently in the past six months. So I was like, is this something that's coming to fruition from that? And might there be more? And in this case, there's a federal court involved that ordered this stoppage, and they're not going to start again until the, the EPA comes up with some evidence, which I think is like, yay, and let's now do vaccines. Yeah, exactly. Shout out to the Fluoride Action Network. They've been doing a great job. I mean, they're behind this whole uh, this whole lawsuit and that that got the they they were the ones that got the ruling that now there's a domino effect happening where you know certain municipalities are recognizing it and this might be a revolution. You know, well, it's and it's amazing. been known <clears throat> like there was a Harvard study ten years ago that uh, fluoride l lowers IQ ten points, right? And then you know there's a group of people trying to dumb us down. And you know the Nazis used fluoride in various capacities and all sorts of other stuff, right? So uh, I learned about this problem from Dr. Paul Conant like, I don't know, 25 years ago. And he's still at it today. So, you know, you have to, as somebody on the field, I always, like, there's, Conant's over there. And he's just digging in that spot. And nothing's going on. He keeps digging and digging and digging and digging. Oh, he just excavated. Here's freedom. We got it back. But it took a lot of digging for his part to get this little success. I would imagine many times in the past, he might have been discouraged because these are big corporations that are dumping their waste into our water, getting us to pay for it with tax dollars. It's a big scam. And it also, by the way, lowers IQ and inhibits cognitive functions. So it's like a real win-win for globalism, but good luck trying to explain it to people where they don't think you're crazy or a conspiracy theorist to the point where they actually would take action because they find you trustworthy and credible. That has not happened too often in this topic area of fluoride heretofore. So I present to you for tonight's time capsule to, to kick it off. Let's go to a small win before we get to uh, the losses. There's a lot of losses this week. All right, let's go to uh, this comes from ABC News. I had to squint, but I could see it. ABC News. A federal judge in California has ordered the Environmental Protection Agency to address the potential impacts of fluoride in drinking water because high levels could affect children's IQ levels. KTEX's reporter Karina Hollingsworth says the city of Abilene isn't taking any chances. As of right now, I've directed Rodney Taylor with the utility department to stop adding fluoride to the city's drinking supply until the EPA makes a final ruling on, on what they're going to do. City manager Robert Hanna is unsure when the EPA will make that ruling. He said it could be months or even years, and he stresses that the decision to halt water fluoridation is a decision of caution. There's not a real parallel between what we do in the city and what this research shows. This research was uh, mostly done in foreign countries, mostly with groundwater, and mostly uh, in areas where fluoride occurs very, very high uh, naturally. The city manager says the city of Abilene previously followed American Dental Association recommendations. We treat our drinking water to 0.7 parts per million of fluoride. That's the recommendation by the American Dental Association. Um, the research that this judge relied upon, they had levels that were uh, you know, 1.5 parts per million all the way to you know, four, five, six, seven parts per million, so dramatically higher levels. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, water fluoridation keeps teeth strong and reduces cavities by about 25 percent. But Carol Crockett says she agrees with the city's decision. I know a lot of people don't drink like tap water. They, they buy a lot of their water, but I think that's probably one less thing for them to worry about. I mean, the young are like the future. You know, they're dealing with a lot of things now as it is. And so I think that's just a, a great idea to, like I said, to be focused on the people, but even more so to be focused on the young children. So I think that's a good good move. <laughs> Hannah says city council will have an opportunity in their upcoming meeting on October 3rd to make a decision on whether or not they would like to continue fluoridating until the EPA makes a decision. Reporting for KTexas News, I'm Karina Hollingsworth. A federal judge in California has ordered the Environmental Protection Agency to from the post-millennial University of Kansas professor placed on leave after telling students men who won't vote for a woman president should be lined up and, you know what I mean. 
Wow. So we're going to try and keep the uh, the language a little light here. It's a family-friendly show, and we don't want to you know cross any lines there. But this is a professor who, in his classroom, this video has gone massively viral, has stated there's a lot of men who won't vote for Kamala Harris because they don't think a woman should be president. And he says we could take those or something about taking we could take those men and line them all up and if you know what I mean. Then he panics and says, wait, was that recorded? Delete that. Delete that. I don't want the dean to find out. (laughs) He's been placed on leave. But this is, I mean, should have been fired, not placed on leave. Can you imagine placing should've someone on leave when they placed said, on leave? No, you should be fired immediately. Because you're you're in an academic setting talking about when you believe people should be shot. That is complete insanity. The fact that you could get away with that but and still have your job. This is the party of love and tolerance. Yeah. But this is this is the same party. This is the same people who cheered and celebrated when they heard that that uh, that President Trump was almost unaloft. Mm-hmm. You know. These these are the same people who were laughing about it and saying, oh, I'm, 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 oh, I'm so sad like that they missed. Oh, they, they should have had a better they should have had better aim. These are the same people. This is the party of hate and division. Disgusting. Amen. Evil. This is evil versus good at this point. I mean, after I have month- never wished death on someone because they didn't support Trump. Right. Never. I, I wish life happiness and safety to the people I don't like. I want Joe Biden to be in his rocking chair on his porch with his kids and grandkids running around in the the yard playing with, you know, old, I don't know, what the commander or whatever the dog's name (laughs) was. And he's got a little blanket on his lap rocking back and forth with a glass of sun tea. I mean, that sounds nice. Just stay away from our politics. Let us take over and fix things. And we're going to say, go go sit on your porch and do 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 whatever you do away from us. Exactly. No, the reason I want Trump to win is because even though he is imperfect, I think he's going to be better for this country. And that includes for people living in this country whose political views I disagree with. I don't want them to get hurt. Like, Mm -hmm. my desire isn't for them to be hurt. I think that when Donald Trump gets here elected, there's certainly certain people he needs to stop from doing the things that they're doing. For example, he needs to make sure that criminals are thrown in jail. He needs to make sure that the people in the deep state who have been overstepping their authority and trying to usurp democracy are punished for that. But I don't want my enemies to be subject to violence because of their political views. Well, we've been saying for a long time the the interest in violence, the violent political rhetoric has been one sided. It's really been coming from progressives yeah. in, in I would say progressives in the media and in other institutions, and this includes academia. And so, in this case, I am not totally surprised by this. But at the same time, you cannot say that you guys are the party of peace and have this be sort of a casual conversation that's had. Uh, I think this is the the lie that the left wants to sell, that you need to live in fear of your neighbors who may or may not have a Trump sign in their yard. They're lunat- Thank you all for being here. As you just heard a moment ago, it is being reported now that there was a third assassination attempt on Donald Trump. This would mark the fourth assassination plot on Donald Trump that we know of in only the past couple of months. A man was arrested about a half mile outside of the Coachella rally yesterday with a loaded shotgun, a handgun, and fake passes. They say they were fake VIP passes, as well as a phony press pass. I don't know what that means, a phony press pass, but if the guy's not a journalist, something was up. The Sheriff's Department believes that this guy was intending to kill Donald Trump, that he was some kind of sovereign citizen type of some sort. But we don't know for sure. What I think is likely to end up happening is the media is going to report this as, well, let's not jump the gun. We don't know what this man's intentions were, much like with Ryan Ruth in, uh, yeah. in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. They were initially reporting that it was not an assassination attempt that we learned that it was. And this guy actually had some kind of writings and a plan and a pitch to other people. He was offering money should he have been caught. So I think there's a strong possibility it turns out that this guy was trying to take Trump's life. But I do want to be careful because it is very preliminary. The news just broke within the past hour or so. But I do think it shows, as we've heard a moment ago as well, the desperation of, well, these people who don't like Donald Trump. And I'd like to say Democrat voters or liberals or whatever that might mean, but this isn't just one group of people that's easy to identify. It seems to be, at least on the surface, people who have been fed lies through the corporate press and through a political manipulation machine, the misinformation industrial complex. How do we solve that problem? I don't know. It's very difficult, but we try every single day. That's why we do the show we do, and many of you watch. I really do appreciate it. But when you have two coalitions, you've got Robert F. Kennedy Jr. joining with Donald Trump in one of the most iconic photos I've seen in my life. When he shook hands with Donald Trump, explosions behind him. I was inspired. 
To see Tulsi Gabbard join with Donald Trump as well, I would call this a dream administration. In 2020, I have been reading articles about the, the failures of Trump's foreign policy, albeit his foreign policy was the best I've seen in my life. And it's a lot of what I've been asking for, for my whole life. In the 2000s, when I'm protesting in Chicago, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, wondering what's going on. I'm a teacher. I, I have no idea what's going on. Barack Obama made promises that he did not keep. Some he did. He blew up a lot of kids. That's what he did. He killed, he killed American citizens without charge or trial, and we've never gotten real answers for that. But, you know, I can bring that up, and I can mention that, you know, very few presidents are, are, are going to get it perfectly. In fact, I would say nobody does. But with Donald Trump, what do we see? No new wars. It's the first time in my life, and it's kind of scary to think. I'm 38. Every day of my life, there's been a president starting some kind of war, except Donald Trump. In fact, he started pulling our troops out of these conflicts and asking the question why we're footing the bill for whatever this foreign intervention is, nation building. We're going to be there for six generations so that the minds of the children of Afghanistan become Americanized. It's a ridiculous proposal, but at the same time, in our country, we're complaining about roads falling apart, bridges falling apart, a border that's falling apart, pipes that are full of lead and Legionnaire's disease. So in the 2000s, I'm going through all this activism, wondering why these problems are happening and what we're going to do about them, but I was fairly naive. Uh, Tim was a leftist, and he was a reporter, and he has a transition story he's telling there. But uh, that's not the focus of what we're going forward at. But he did make a point that would make some people on the left raise their eyebrows. Uh, he was making comments about Obama killing American citizens. Uh, yeah, he did. And LD, would you play that uh, clip? Because he talks about it in his book, too. Obama has a quote. That's, that's what I was looking up. He has a quote where he said he's really good at killing people. And some of those people are American citizens, and they didn't really, no one made a big deal about it. Must have been like, I don't know, it's okay for him. So, LD, will you play just a little bit of that Young Turks quote? Because that was the first clip I found that would substantiate the, uh, the rumor. So there's a new book out by Mark Halpern and John Heileman. Uh, they had written a book about the 2008 campaign. This is about... Uh, 2012 campaign. It's called Double Down Game Change 2012. It's got a lot of revelations that people are talking about. The one that struck me as the most important is uh, President Obama's line. Apparently, he told his aides that he's now, quote, really good at killing people. Now, that's in reference to the drone program. Uh, that's a little disturbing, uh, given that that's not true in a couple of different ways. Um, it's disturbing if it was true and he bragged about it. It's also disturbing for why it's not true, which I'll get to in a second. But right, now, good, did he cool. really say it? Can you really take Did he really say it? Uh, I don't know if he really said it. That's part of the history. You have to like read between the lines. So to read between the lines, you ask the question, did Obama authorize a drone strike on Anwar Alawaki's U.S. citizen son who grew up and lived in like Colorado and California? Right. We weren't at war with Yemen. There's a whole line of thought behind that. But uh, I guess those types of things aren't relevant for people who just want to watch the media and believe. But otherwise, like uh, there's disconcerting things about all the presidents and pretty much all the presidential candidates, kids. And uh, there are those of us who have looked into this and it's like, I think we could do better than right side or left side. But we're not going to do better by choosing one of those sides. So we need to like identify the layers, see the stratification, and then bridge that gap with knowledge, understanding, and bring some new understanding to the forum uh, that could help alleviate the problem at the root cause instead of just banging at the symptoms all the time. So <clears throat> coming up in uh, this next block, we got a, a whole bunch of stuff. So Scott, before we get to that, did you have any comments on uh, the opening salvo of news? Okay, so... You know, there was a lot of talk about, you know, not wanting to hurt the other side. And yeah, absolutely not. Um, I, I mean, it's like, OK, so I live in a neighborhood. I've mentioned this several times on the show or it's like I'm just surrounded by walls, signs and anti-gun signs everywhere. You know what I mean? It's pretty crazy. You live in you know, Rainbow City. Yeah, I, I it's it's weird. It's weird. But it's like I, I wouldn't dare put a Trump sign out front. Like even though like, even if I was like, you know, root, voting for Trump or rooting for Trump, you can I, support never. Trump without offending your neighbors. Yeah, exactly. Is what you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. And and so there's that. But, you know, so when it comes down to it, though, the only thing is I kind of there's a part of me. I don't want to say hurt their feelings, but I, like offend their feelings hmm. like that. That's something that I, I, I that I, that I enjoy. You know, the, do you the, realize the whole, you don't have any agency over that? 
Yeah, I guess that's true. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, so People like own the their own feelings and have to be exactly. responsible for them. Exactly. Their feelings exactly. are how they feel about the words they're using to think. And they're, I have nothing to do with any of that. And we just met. So I'm maybe, not trying to hurt anybody's feelings at any given exactly, time. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe it's not hurt their feelings, but uh, trigger their sacred cows and things that they hold sure. dear that need to be questioned. Trigger. Trigger a little bit. Mm -hmm. I guess that's okay. The other thing I was thinking is that like, um, I couldn't help but notice like the that Israel flag there that Tim was preaching in front of. Like, yeah, I saw even, that like, too. Like preach anti-war like in front of that. Like, like he doesn't know any better. I have a lot of thoughts about the whole Trump Israel thing and like where that's lead, where that's going. You know, did I tell you? Okay, I don't think I told this on the show last night, but I went to. Uh, I think I mentioned in the production chat, but it's worth. Yeah, you it. I think we talked in the the pre uh, the pre show last week or okay. the after show last it's, week about it. It's go ahead. Okay, well, yeah. So I have some friends here in Tennessee that invited me to uh, to church on this Sunday. It was a Pastor Greg Locke's church, and I know he's a very you know controversial figure because he's like so. Um, you know, anti-woke and outspoken and all that. And I was like, that's the extent of the knowledge that I knew about him. I was like, yeah, dude, I kind of want to go see like a, you know, an anti-woke preacher. Like, this would be great. And uh, so we walked in and immediately, you guys, it's the most insane thing ever. Like, it was just Israel flags everywhere. Not a single U.S. flag, American flag in the whole building. It was only Israel flags. On the little tub where they were baptizing people, there was an Israel flag draped on the baptism tub. They were like baptizing people in, and it wasn't even like a like a like a rabbinical Judaism symbol. It was like the state I was just going to say, Israel. dude, you were in a synagogue. It makes sense. It was the state of Israel, dude. And there was armed security guards everywhere, with AR-15s everywhere, which I was like, that's great. But all of them on their on their plate carriers on their bulletproof vests, yeah, they had. Israel flags, like like as the patch, the Israel flag patch, no U.S. flag patches. And and he even said in his sermon, and I, I stuck around for the sermon a little bit. I did leave early, but he said Palestine never existed. Palestine never even existed. And anybody oh. that tells you differently, I was like, whoa. And I just felt so bad because all the people there, I was like, he's just like leading them astray, man. It was crazy. Hey, uh, I just have a question. I'm asking for a friend. If they never existed, why did you guys have to wipe all their towns off the face of the earth and then redraw the maps and call yeah. the towns new things? Yeah. And so I was just blown. Sorry. I'm not supposed to away. say stuff like that. Yeah, that Dude, it was the crazy. It was so surreal. And every, like a third of the people there had, I stand with Israel shirts on. And I was just like, these people just don't even know, dude. They don't even know what they're, what, what's going on. Like I'll sit with Israel. We can have a talk about these things, but yeah. you know, if we get to the part where it doesn't make sense, I got to get up and walk yeah, away. Dude, it was wild. It was wild, wild, wild. And I had my comic, some conversations with my friends afterward and they didn't know any of this stuff either. And I was just like, this is the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, this is really crazy stuff. And then people told me that uh, he got... Hey, you should work for Vice. That sounds like a Vice documentary right there. Yeah, it really does, dude. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then everybody said that he got owned in a flat earth debate. So, of course, I had to go watch that. And that was pretty hilarious, too. So, and, oh, yeah? and I, so now I know everything about Pastor Greg Locke. And I'm, like, <clears throat> I'm good. You're on flat earth. It's like a package deal. Exactly. So, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. It's just like... It's just crazy to see, like, this... Um, the, the infiltration and the overlap. It's just like... And, and it's just, it's, I don't know, man. Like the You should ask if he's a member of the World Council on churches of churches, because that's like the CIA took control of like... Okay. Yeah, well, it's the whole thing. We talked, there was an autonomy Q&A earlier. These topics came up. Interesting. A whole bunch of things. Morals and dogma came up. I had this book out, because there's questions and there are answers, so I got books. Twice a year, I teach a course called Autonomy. It's a 12-week course. It teaches leadership, entrepreneur skills, executive skills, all these types of things that I saw were taken out of our education system in order to make the schooling or indoctrination system that we've all probably went through. And it has served us well enough to be interchangeable cogs in the machine of the globalists. But if we want a homestead, if we want uh, a write our own ticket, work from home job, work from anywhere type of situation... They're not exactly handing those out at the end of college. They give you a piece of paper and they're like, good luck. So reality is dropping us off here, but the demands of reality are up here. So I created autonomy to help people close that gap for themselves so they can level up their skills to the demands of the situations that life is putting in front of us presently. Life's demands of intellect and understanding precision and complexity are ever increasing. The schooling didn't prepare us for it. The media is not going to do anything but reinforce what schooling prepared us for. And so we're going to have to take a leadership position and take steps off the beaten path to kind of blaze our own trail in life.
What makes the Grand Theft World podcast unique, invigorating, exciting, and informative? Most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news. They're covering current events from the day they happen. And that is effective. It's useful. It's a great starting point. And then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story. So we like to give it a little time. You have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage. And the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history, we give you the source notes, the references, we do deep dives, and this really empowers you with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get into the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested, in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game. What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread? Who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? Come on, man. What are we talking about? You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you said you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job to, as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40 year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on.